Welcome to Past Tense, a modern conversation podcast. We are taking you on a journey of connection as we discuss issues and events from the past 400 years relating to finding meaning in the modern world with our distinguished panelists. We end each Past Tense podcast by giving our guests the last word and the opportunity to answer the vital question, what do you know now? We hope each of you will be able to answer the same question and say, I have just listened to the Past Tense, a modern conversation podcast, and this is what I know now. Welcome back to another exciting episode of A Modern Conversation. Today we have two special guests, Sylvie and Sierra, and we're going to talk about some of the great creations of the modern age of the 20th century. So let's go ahead and, and uh, turn some time to Sylvie and Sierra to introduce themselves, and then we'll jump right in. Sierra, go ahead. Hello, I am Sierra Carnahan, and I am a business management major and I'm from Boise, Idaho. And today I am an expert on um, the modern art of cubism. Hi, my name is Sylvie Knowles and I am a marriage and family study major. I am from Middleton, Idaho and I am a master in film, the history of filmmaking of the 20th century. Okay, very good. Thank you so much for uh, being on our show today. So let's start first with Sierra and uh, what is cubism? Tell us a little bit more about it if you would. Yeah, so cubism, the cubism is a type of art that artists uh, look at specific objects or people and they look at them in different perspectives and kind of break them up and put them back all together and with like different viewpoints. And uh, cubism, cubism <laughs> uh, has been the most influential, influential art movement of the 20th century. And um, I have a quote and it says, it radically destroyed tradition, traditional in illusionism in painting, revolutionized the way we see the world and paved the way for the pure abstraction that dominated Western art for the next 50 years. So highly influential. Uh, and when, when did this uh, movement of art begin? Um, I I believe it started in like the so early 1900s, so like 1909, um, to like the 1920s. I feel like was the most time it reigned. Okay, and who would you consider some of the most influential artists of this era? Mm -hmm. So um, one was uh, Juan Gritz. And Pablo Picasso was definitely the most famous one. Um, he's a Spanish painter, painter, sculptor, and printmaker. And um, did you know that he was also a ceramicist and a theater designer? I did not know that. that that's quite interesting. It doesn't surprise me. I think he had his hands in just about everything from yeah. a young age up till his, his near 90. So... Um, all right, uh, tell us um, a little bit more about Picasso, maybe some of his most famous paintings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he um, had many, just like you said, he had his hands in everything. So like when he um, died, they found for 45,000 unsold works in his house, um, which like include like thousands of paintings, sculpts, sculptors, ceramics, drawings, sketchbooks, and like thousands of stuff, and tapestries and rugs. And uh, he like had many, many different things in de different periods of time too. But one of his most famous paintings was the Guernica. Um, and this was painted in 1937, and it's on a huge, massive canvas, and it's like 11 feet tall and 25 feet across. And, um, it is exhibited in one of the uh, museums in Madrid. The Reina Sofia, uh, their, their Museum of Modern Art is beautiful in Madrid. So um, where did he paint it? Uh, maybe why has it become so famous, etc.? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he actually painted it in his home in Paris. And why it has become so famous is because it's um, very moving and it's powerful, at, like 
of an anti-war painting of history. And yeah. <laughs> so specifically, who do we see depicted in the painting? Um, so there's lots of women uh, throughout the painting um, and they're very distressed. And there's a bull and a horse. And there's also a soldier that um, I think the word they used is disembodied mm -hmm. and flames. And so there's a lot of chaos and horror within this painting. So is it supposed to be of a particular scene or what's the kind of the context of, of, the, of this particular painting? Yeah, so he was inspired by a specific event that happened in history of when the Nazis bombed northern Spain. Um, and so he took this horrific event and put it into um, cubism art and um, we can see like the woman uh, like one is holding a dead child and like others are trying to escape or um, holding a light and uh, he just embodied it into his art to show um, the horrors of war basically so yeah as we look at this uh, a print of it which is again nothing like the original um, you can see the chaos and the distress um, things just don't add up right mm -hmm. uh, as you look at across the board and it's a it's a powerful statement against uh, or almost a testimony of the horrors of war yeah. so okay thank you very much um, so let's let's turn to this uh, cubistic style. Where where and or how did he develop cubism along with George Brock? Um, yeah, so mm, he developed it mostly by himself. I feel like, um, but there is a unique, particular um, style that he picked up from, which is African art. Mm. Um, and like thirty years pr uh, before Guernica. He painted this painting called uh, The L Young Ladies of Abaddon. Mm -hmm. And um, he used the, he was inspired by African masks and he implemented that into his art. Yeah, so I think I, uh, he, his father, who was an artist as well, art teacher, he took him to museums and he saw these kind of tribal masks as a young age and it seemed to leave a, a strong impression on him and we can see even in some of those the figures on the right hand side right you can see them in these sort of um, uh, tribal-esque type, type type of mask so mm -hmm. uh, who's depicted in the Le de the uh, Demoiselle de Avignon what's the subject matter yeah so there are five naked women on this painting um, and they are prostitutes in a brothel in on a street in Barcelona, and so he um, depicts them as very like angular and disjointed, and um, you can't like tell which is the front or the back, and uh, with the African masks, and yeah, it's very interesting. Not your typical Renaissance painting, etc. So. I'm curious, uh, do we know how people reacted to the Demoiselle painting? Yeah, they did not like it. It was very controversial and a very <laughs> it was like a widespread anger. And even his closest friends and associates were not okay with it. And so he painted it in 1907, uh, but he first released it in 1916 and it was deemed immoral. Mm -hmm coming out of the Victorian era, et cetera, we can, we can see. Uh, any, any particular quotes that we might have from research on people's reactions? Um, or no. from Picasso himself? <laughs> yeah, so in my research, I found something really interesting about Picasso himself. Um, he was characterized as a womanizer and a misogynist, and this really changed my perspective of him because I didn't know this about him. But he very much thought women, like a quote says, women are machines for suffering and that there are only two kinds of women, goddesses and doormats. And he 
had many women throughout all of his life and th this quote is actually really interesting but one of his mistresses said he he submitted them uh, the women to his animal sexuality tamed them bewitched them ingested them and crushed them onto his canvas after he had spent many nights extracting their essence once they were blood dry he would dispose of them and i just found this super interesting because it definitely changed my perspective of, P of picasso and um his artwork too like with the with the uh what are they called prostitutes yes. um I, yeah, I don't know what I think about Picasso anymore, but his art is beautiful. Interesting. So um, I think it's a good reminder to go to the source, right? If we can find what Picasso said, as you mentioned mm -hmm. here, or his grandfather, etc., cetera, and uh, what, what people really are in essence. So, okay, thank you so much uh, for your discussion and, and uh, knowledge of, of uh, early 20th century painting, especially cubism. Let's transition to perhaps the most unique form of art, which is cinema of the 20th century. And we'll turn some time to Sylvie. And uh, Sylvie, looking in your, uh, your sort of resume here, it looks like you're a film historian. And uh, I'd love to a little, know a little bit more about the origins of uh, cinema in the early 20th century and its impact on on our modern culture so go ahead and and uh, teach us <laughs> yes thank you um the definition of cinematography is the illusion of movements by the subsequent rapid projection of still photographic pictures on screen and Throughout the years, cinema has become a medium of mass entertainment and com communication. And the interesting, interesting thing about the cinema is that no one person created it. It was a group effort. Like the Edison Company demonstrated a prototype of the ketoscope, which allowed one person at a time to view moving pictures. And in December 1895 in Paris, France, the Lumiere brothers presented projected moving pictures to the play, to the playing audience. And this was only the beginning for films. In the beginning, um, the films were two, one to two minutes long and they didn't have much dialogue or color, so they were mostly black and white, but it was still not considered a silent movie. And, but as technology evolved, it completely changed the film industry. And there's a quote that goes, technology has taken the film industry from silent black and white films to high definition movies that are capable of making audiences feel as if they were there in only a short period of time. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, and if we're careful, or if we're not careful, we can get sucked into believing something is real that's really not real, right? Uh, up on the on the big screen, especially. Okay. Really fascinating. So, in other words, it looks like uh, um, cinema began in Europe. Uh, and then quickly came to the United States with Edison, etc. And then we move into the uh, uh, 30s and 40s. Uh, we know that Snow White uh, debuted in 1938. I believe it was February 4th. Uh, generally considered the full or the first full-length animated feature film uh, made by Walt Disney. Uh, tell us more about uh, Snow White. I think it's one of America's kind of gems. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Um, during this time, they didn't have the technology that we have now, so the film progressed really slowly. It took three years and cost about $1.5 million to make, and they had to go from 200 employees to 600 employees to help develop the movie and um, the process of making... Snow White, it was called a multi 
step process of hand cell animation, which meant that they hand drew everything and it eventually resulted in more than 200,000 hand drawn um, drawings for the film. Wow. And for them to check the movements of like the characters and how it was going along and if they needed to do any more change, make any more changes, they had to, the animators had to take the pages and flip them back and forth at like a flip book to check the movements. So like you take a book and thumb through it to be able yeah. to see the, the changes. That's cool. Okay. Uh, what else was maybe uh, innovative of, uh, along or with Snow White? Well, because this process took too long, they invented a um, digital multiplane camera which was the first step in trans transitioning animated films from hand-drawn art to computer-aided creations that we see today. Fascinating. A digital multiplane camera. I'm going to have to Google that to okay, see, <laughs> see what that even looks like. Okay, excellent. 1938. So that's just a year before Germany invades Poland and World War II begins. Well, let's move a little bit more to my era and uh, to May 25th, 1977. What happened then? Yes. Um, the movie that most people considered one of the best franchises out there, Star Wars, came out on that day. It's almost 39 years after Snow White came out, so there's... They... Um, developed a better process but you can still tell throughout the films that the quality isn't as good as it could be and um star wars changed the aesthetics of hollywood films and it quickly became one of the most successful and influ influential franchises in motion picture history and they be, the series began in 1970s to and to the 80 1980s and they still happen to this day 2019 or something was the last of the movie um they continue to make advances in this field of motion and in things like special effect and um, yeah, and I, I remember as a kid seeing some films where George Lucas explained the special effects, which were pretty minimal back then, um, and then how they went out and banged on certain surfaces and objects to see if they could get the, the sounds for the different things, like the, the blaster guns, the pew pew. So that's actually, you know, the... the if you look at a telephone pole, it's usually anchored in the ground with these um, metal cords. And, uh, or, I don't know what they're called. Anyway, and so some of Lucas's people were out banging on these surfaces like that, that cord, and I can't remember what they hit it with, but that, that steel cord that came down, and it made that pew, pew sound, and that's what they recorded for the blaster guns. So I anyway, I've always been I I was hooked from from day one when I was eight years old. <laughs> Same with my family members. Yeah, they love Star Wars. Sometimes I worry though each passing semester that uh, my students are losing contact with uh, with Star Wars. So, um, any particular shots, uh, cinemagraphic uh, film techniques that you might that you might uh, prefer. Yeah, well, there's the tracking shot, which is when the camera moves sideways and, like, up and down and, like, following the characters that, like, say when one character is sprinting across the field, then they would use the tracking shot, and it makes it look more realistic. And there's the point of view shot, which allows us to see what the character is seeing or, like, what like how he sees an event that happened to him. Kind of like having a GoPro stuck on their forehead and yeah. we see things from their vantage point, right? Yeah. Something <laughs> like that, I guess. Okay. And there's the montage, which is a series of pic 
of like separate pictures that are put into one. Like some are moving and some are still and it just gives you a better view of what the character is going through. Yeah, montage are, are huge. So we, we see those in film. I think in class we mentioned the opening montage. It's about four minutes for Up. Gives their whole life, you know. Yeah. And some montages are only 30 seconds. So you have this wealth of information in a, in a condensed period of time. And, of course, the Rocky montages and other things like that. Yeah. Okay, uh, exciting stuff. Uh, any other? Um, well, looks like that's that's what we've got. Okay, uh, we'll we'll end with a question that uh, I've asked to all of our groups, and it is as such. Uh, now that you have studied and become somewhat experts in early twentieth century art and cinema. Um, what can you do to help our uh, audience understand the value of such things in contemporary life? How would you respond to that question, each of you? I think for mine, like specifically cubism, how they see things in different perspectives, I think that's a good thing, like a good, just like an idea that we can implement into our lives. When we see things from different uh, perspectives and viewpoints, um, we can see the world in totally different lights and as we yeah as we keep that in mind and as we appreciate cubism art um, we can um, further our knowledge and like expand our horizons so, yeah yeah especially you know quick judgment is usually always blind judgment right and to take time, step back, look at things from different angles and perspectives and come up with a perhaps less biased, you know, opinions, etc. So it, that's great, great connection. Sylvie, how about you with, with a cinema? For me, I have like always loved films and like movies and TV shows, but I never realized how much work it mm. goes into it. And so sometimes I would get mad at like the quality or the characters and stuff like that and I think that we should all just appreciate that there are people out there who give their time to help make entertainment for us so that we can enjoy watching and like escaping from the real world and we should appreciate how long and how many hours and all that and like all the time that it takes to develop a movie or like to hand draw something mm -hmm. like animation and stuff like that yeah well said so as uh, consumers a lot of times we forget the the behind the scenes right story and, and the time and effort and skill that it takes that's a, another great reminder Okay, well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll sign out. You have been listening to The Past Tense, a modern conversation podcast. We hope that you have learned something today about the modern world by peering with me through various cultural windows. If you enjoyed the messages we shared today, please make sure to share the podcast with others. Thanks to our guest and others who make this podcast possible. Please join us each semester for new, exciting episodes. Past Tense, A Modern Conversation, is a production of the Brigham Young University, Idaho, Department of Humanities.